So, uh, for example, uh, this is a model of uh, of um, uh, stomatal patterning in Arabidopsis leaves. Uh, and uh, although this is a real quite big variety of topics, uh, the overarching themes that we're interested in how single cell behavior or how dynamics at the level of single cells uh, translates to uh, collective cell behavior and how the collective cell behavior that is generated by these cells is feeding back on individual cell behavior. And, and uh, so we are particularly interested in these kind of, uh, yeah, uh, multiscale feedback loops. And in the end, uh, you know, wh wh what, what really motivates me, what really interests me is, is uh, morphogenesis. So what I want to understand is how the linear information in the DNA is translated into the three-dimensional shape of organisms. And uh, so basically, how do we go from here? Are you, can you see my mouse pointer? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay, yeah. So, so basically, I'm interesting, interested in how do we go from here to there? And of course, there is this interesting process of development in between. And I really see then morphogenesis as collective behavior. Like, for example, uh, collective be, uh, the collective behavior of a flock of birds, where uh, simple rules at the level of the individual birds, uh, and of course, there's a lot of complexity beneath, under these uh, uh, simple rules, but simple rules at the levels of, of the bird can lead to complex behavior at the level of the whole flock. And then the level of the whole flock can feed back on what the bird does, because that it will respond to uh, neighboring uh, birds, it will do something else when it's away from other birds than when it's in, in the middle of the flock. And in the same way, a uh, um, uh, cell in a tissue will respond on what cells are nearby, or whether it's close to the ECM, or whether it's close to, uh, uh, to other cells, whether it's uh, 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 along, uh, close to a fiber, and so forth. And of course, to understand these kind of questions, we have to simplify also experimentally. And that's why I uh, became interested in um, the behavior of endothelial cells and uh, the question of how can these endothelial cells form blood vessels. So endothelial cells are basically, uh, yeah, you could say the building blocks of blood vessels. And so uh, one of the ways you can study that, and this, I'm happy to say that this is now the first data that is coming from my own lab my own wet lab where we can, so we can also do now experiments to test our models. Uh, so that is, uh, these are, uh, hum uh, these are uh, human microvascular endothelial cells, immortalized, an immortalized cell line, uh, played it out in metrogel, which mimics uh, the natural environment that cells are in. And they will, as a, uh, they will uh, organize into uh, these kind of network-like patterns. Yeah. And uh, when I started my postdoc in Bloomington, Indiana with uh, James Glazer, I started, uh, 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 became interested in what are, what are the rules that cells need to follow in order to form these kind of uh, network-like patterns. And, and what we use for that is, is the cellular POTS model. And so just to give you a brief overview, uh, basically the cellular POTS model models uh, describes random cell motility. So it describes uh, protrusions, retractions of cell boundaries, and so forth. And their uh, cells live on a grid. Uh, one uh, cell is covering multiple grid points. Cells uh, can then interact with additional fields. For example, this can be a field of a growth factor, or it can be a field uh, uh, describing uh, strains and stresses in the ECM, as I will show later on. And then we uh, say that cells will move due to balance between reactive forces. For example, a cell is pulling on a neighboring cell and the adjacent cell will follow. Uh, and active move movement. So the cell is actively generating a force and will push away another cell. And uh, well, a classic, the classical problem that this model has been developed for is uh, cell sorting. You see a little example of that where we have two uh, types of cells, a green cell type and a red cell type. So you can see, I hope this is well visible, uh, but you can see uh, little uh, black lines around these cells and little black lines around the green cells. Uh, 
and basically based on due to differential adhesion these cells will so sort out and the most adhesive cells will go to the middle and the less of adhesive cells will go to the outside and this is to give you a little bit more detail about it in case uh, yeah uh, so basically what we have we describe a balance of forces using an energy function uh, so we have in this example with two uh, components we say there is cell adhesion and uh, we say that uh, cell adhesion leads to an adhe adhesion energy at cell boundaries and then we have a volume constraint so we say that for every uh, cell it has to stay close to uh, a particular kind of target volume uh, now what we then do is uh, to calculate uh, what how the system will develop we pick a random neighbor uh, aside we then pick a random neighbor uh, we consider the energy change that would occur if uh, we accepted this particular copying if this is negative it means there is a passive force that is dragging this cell in this direction this side in this direction so then we accept it if this energy is positive it means that it won't occur unless there is an active force that uh, pushes uh, the cell in this direction and we uh, model these uh, active forces in the most simple form with a Boltzmann function a Boltzmann probability function we say there's a, a uh, yeah we say there's uh, it's an exponential decay like this so there is uh, going to be high probability that we still accept uh, that we accept uh, uh, small moves and there is a lower probability that we accept uh, strong forces and but of course you could replace this for any uh, uh, other distribution and so what can we now do with this well one of the first uh, things we tested is whether uh, uh, to, to answer these questions how cells interact with formal blood vessel is to say well suppose that cells are secreting a growth factor by which they attract one another. So, uh, so what we then do, we add a partial differential equation layer. So we add this kind of field. And we say that at any place where we have a cell, there is a source of this chemoattractant. Uh, it diffuses away and uh, uh, it degrades. So we get exponential gradients around these cells. And then we say that the cells have a higher probability of protruding uh, uh, in the direction of this chemoattractant such that slowly the cells will move towards higher concentrations of the chemoattractant. And so this is a way that we can uh, put a biological hypothesis into a mathematical model like the cell Pulse model. And then of course you can imagine that if you assume that cells are attracting one another through a chemoattractant that uh, this won't generate uh, network-like patterns but merely something like this. You get uh, uh, collection of cell blobs and uh, eventually uh, based on how much noise you add they will all coalesce into one single blob so then we asked uh, what do we need to add in order to uh, get network like patterns and one of the uh, hypotheses we had is that maybe uh, cell shape matters so we zoom in a little in these cell cultures you see here individual endothelial cells they are elongated. We now change our model such that the cells become elongated and we can do so by adding an extra component to the Hamiltonian um, with uh, some extra complications. I can explain that later on. Uh, we can then generate uh, elongated cells and it turns out, and this is uh, a bit of early work, this was mostly based on my postdoc work with uh, James Glazer, um, then it turns out that this suffices to generate uh, network-like patterns. And uh, interestingly, they have a type of coarsening behavior that resembles very much the coarsening behavior we find in uh, uh, endothelial cell cultures. So what we did here is count the number of branching points over time. And we see that uh, in silico, slowly these branching points uh, 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 drop over time. The number of branching points is indicate indicative of this coarsening behavior, and uh, we see the same in uh, in the cell cultures. So uh, currently, a student of mine is is working with this uh, new data that we're now generating in the lab, or that we 
generated before the whole crisis and um, uh, to get a little bit more detail into this. But this was done just by taking out uh, the, the cell cultures, taking a photograph on uh, more or less the same place or exactly the same place, and then just uh, using some image analysis techniques to count the number of branching points. But I hope we can now do this in a little bit more detail. But so far so good. But uh, so we now have a model where we can um, reproduce network patterns. They uh, behave more or less in the same way, but uh, actually a model that that kind of reproduces what we see and is not always that interesting. And the reason that it's not that interesting is also because we uh, have a lot of other models that can also produce network-like patterns. So, so we have to find a way to start selecting between these different scenarios, between these different hypotheses. And that's why I'm now so happy that we can actually start testing these, these models and look how well we can match the, the dynamics. And so we also, this also gives us, gives us the opportunity to start looking for, uh, for um, cases where the model breaks down. And I believe that those are actually the most interesting parts because then uh, we can start thinking, okay, the, what did we miss from our model? And one obvious way where this kind of model breaks down is if you look at uh, the effect of matrix dynamics, matrix mechanics. And so these are published experiments. They are from the Cynthia Reinhardt King uh, lab, where uh, they took a different kind of endothelial cell. These are bovine aortic endothelial cells. So, so cells taken from the inside of uh, cow uh, aorta vessels, uh, aortas. Uh, you can culture them on a synthetic matrix. This is called a poly polyacrylamide matrix and a nice property of that is that you can control the stiffness of that really well by controlling the different components, the concentration of different components that you, that you, uh, uh, chemicals that you use to make the gel. And it turns out that on a soft matrix, depending on yet another parameter, but the, uh, with, uh, 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 depending on the, uh, the ability of these cells to generate networks depends on the stiffness of this gel. So uh, in this uh, configurations on really soft gels, the cells form network-like patterns and on really stiff gels, they form yeah, a more disorganized patterns, almost a monolayer. So in order to explain this, our model must also include substrate mechanics. And that's why we started looking into how can we now incorporate substrate mechanics in our cellular POTS models. So what we're doing now is in much the same way as we, gen we included a partial differential equation field in our uh, cellular POTS model, we're now going to include a uh, finite element uh, field to model substrate mechanics. And uh, to, to do that, first we go back a little bit to single cell behavior. And we try to uh, explain a particularly uh, interesting uh, single cell behavior. That is, uh, so this is for cardiomyocytes. I, I, use this picture because the picture is nice, but it works more or less the same for endothelial cells. Uh, so if you take, if you put these kind of cells on really soft gels, they, uh, they tend to contract and form uh, small rounded shapes. If you put them on a really stiff uh, substrate like glass, they will spread out like pancakes. And if you put them on the intermediate, intermediate substrate, they will start elongating like here. So what, uh, what do cells need to do in order to form these kind of, uh, this kind of dependence on substrate stiffness? So, uh, so one of the hypothesized mechanisms in the literature is the following, and that's called mechanical reciprocity between cells and the, uh, between cells and the substrate. So the idea is that cells continuously apply forces on the environment. So these forces then deform the matrix locally. And a particular property of this matrix is that it will strain stiffen. So like a rubber band, if you pull, pull it a little bit, it will just act like a, an, a, an ideal spring. But if you pull it a little bit further, it, won't, it, it will become stiffer. It won't get, you won't be able to pull it further. So that is called strain stiffening. And it can occur, for example, uh, because ex, uh, extracellular matrix is often a mixture between elastic materials, 
and uh, stiffer materials that are uh, like little strings, for example, collagen. And then uh, the cells are adhered to the matrix through um, uh, cell substrate connections that stabilized uh, stabilize on strain uh, substrate. These are called focal adhesions. And they almost act like, uh, like uh, Chinese finger traps. So the strange property they have is that if you, if you pull on them, they will become stronger. And then, uh, uh, and the only way to kind of loosen them is to reduce the force and then to pull a little bit again. <laughs> so uh, in this way, you can imagine that, um, that by pulling and by, uh, by pulling this, the substrate becomes stiffer. And then uh, also the, the connections with the substrate become st stronger. So let us see whether we can put that in a mathematical model and see what are the consequences of that. And so we did that in the following way. So uh, we start with our cellular POTS model. Oh, giving it away already. We started with the cellular POTS model. Uh, it forms a kind of wiggly shape. So from that shape, we have an empirical model where we can predict cell forces. And the basic idea of that empirical model that was introduced by uh, Lemon and Romer a couple of years ago uh, is that uh, the further any point is away from center of mass of the cell, the larger the force will be. So these, these extensions here will apply a large force on the substrate. And this, uh, this agrees very, uh, quite well, actually, uh, pretty well, actually, with uh, 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 data on pillared substrates and also with data on flexible substrates. So then uh, we assume that at each of these points that uh, is covered by the cell, there is uh, a potential connection with the substrate. And these are called, these, these are models of our focal adhesions. We model each of those using a uh, ordinary differential equation. Uh, and we assume that these uh, act as a cluster of catch slip-ons, that uh, mechanical tension, so this maximum, that uh, the maximum traction force that is coming from this model B is uh, slowly built up until its maximum. Uh, and um, um, uh, then uh, we assume that this equilibrium, uh, so this buildup is depending on the force that the cell is applying, but also on the resisting force. And so that means that on a stiffer substrate, it's easier for the cell to move to its maximum force than on the soft substrate, because on the soft substrate, it will just give way. So this is also based on the previous model by, um, by uh, Schwartz and others. Uh, so, so now we put all of that, so that means that uh, we now can get growth uh, of, uh, sorry, I'm trying to hide the video a little bit because it's in the way of my slide. So now we go uh, to um, the, um, uh, uh, so, so that gives us the size of the focal adhesion that we can uh, then put back in the cellular POTS model. And we assume that, remember that for the cellular POTS model, we have these protrusions and retractions. So uh, we now assume that if there's a large focal adhesion, a retraction will be harder than uh, a protrusion. All right. So, um, so what is the result of that? So, um, um, so uh, what you see here is uh, how a model slowly, uh, how model cell slowly spreads over time. And you see that uh, at the edges, we have the largest focal adhesions. May, I, I hope you can see this well. Uh, so we have these little dots and at the edges, they are larger than in the center. In the center, they're almost absent. And now we see is that um, on a soft substrate, uh, we don't see any of these focal adhesions and the cells remain rather small. And that's because they cannot uh, generate sufficient traction force in order to stabilize those focal adhesions. And that means that also if this, the cell can retract quite easily and uh, it remains very small. Now on the stiff substrate, every time it, it extends, it kind of gets, uh, it kind of clicks Right, so it gets stuck and it cannot retract. It will extend further and it cannot retract. So you get almost a, a ratchet kind of mechanism 
and this leads to the spreading out of the cell. But now we can explain why cells stay small and we can explain why cells spread out, but we can ex explain this elongation. Um, so for that, we need to have a, a more detailed feedback with the extracellular matrix. So what we do, what we have now, we have an extended model. So we had A, B, and D, and we now introduce C. So we first have the cellular pods model, then we calculate the traction forces. Then we feed those traction forces to a finite element model that will uh, uh, predict for us the uh, deformation that is due to this uh, force. So then we say, well, on a um, strange finite elements matrix, the, um, uh, the uh, focal thesians will stabilize more easily. And this, uh, this will be due to a recruitment of uh, stabilizing proteins like vinculins and talons. And this is uh, 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 an example of how this can, can work. So, um, so that gives us again, uh, sizes for the focal thesians. And now we can go back to the cell pods model uh, and see which uh, parts of the cell will retract and which will protrude and we can continue the whole thing again. So now if we put all of that together, <coughs> we get uh, something quite interesting. We uh, first find that on soft substrates, the cells uh, still stay small, but now on the intermediate matrices, they will start elongating. And if you look at this end result, I will play the movie again. We can see that the cell starts wiggling quite randomly initially, but once it manages to get a slightly elongated shape, this will lead to um, uh, larger forces on either end because uh, yeah, the forces are proportional to the distance from the center of mass. Then that will stabilize the focal tissues and it will generate, uh, oh sorry, by this it will generate matrix deformation and this will stabilize the focal tissues, but it will also stabilize the adjacent focal tissues. So this, uh, this uh, tension almost lead, uh, works as a kind of integrating signal that will um, stabilize not only the, 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 the focal tension itself that experiences the force, but also adjacent focal tensions. And this allows the cells then to elongate slowly. And you can now see that indeed uh, for uh, soft matrices, we have uh, uh, fairly uh, spherical cells, uh, also for very stiff matrices, but for intermediate matrices, we now have uh, elongating cells. So please also interrupt me if you have uh, any questions. And now we can, of course, change uh, all kinds of parameters. For example, one uh, uh, thing that have been, has been observed in the literature is that uh, cells uh, on different, different types of cells on the same stiffnesses have different behaviors and also they can elongate, but maybe at different stiffnesses. And one of the parameters that has been put forward for that is uh, the uh, speed by which ectomycin is contracting. And indeed we can nicely predict this in our model. So the speed of ectomycin contraction determines at what stiffness these cells are elongating. So now we have a model of uh, cell movement and uh, cell um, uh, and the role of focal adhesions in cell movement on flexible substrates. And it turns out we can use the same model not only to explain cell shape, but also to explain other uh, behaviors of cells. And um, uh, one of these is the, prop the, the ability of cells to move to stiffer parts of the substrate. Uh, so what I have here is uh, a cell, just like in the previous model. I have a gradient of stiffness from one kilopascals to 26 kilopascals. And now I'm going to run the model. This is the initial position. And you see again, this wiggling behavior, the cell doesn't quite know where to go. Uh, it's trying to elongate a little bit, but it doesn't really uh, 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 succeed in that. But also we see that it slowly drifts towards a stiffer part. And now why is that? And that's because on the stiffer part of the substrate, the cells can generate more forces 
and they uh, it's more easily easy for them to stabilize the focal adhesions. Whereas on the softer part, it uh, yeah they're a little bit less stable. So slowly, uh, so there it's easier to retract. Whereas the connection connections to the substrate on the stiffer part are more stable. So slowly the cells drift towards the stiffer part. Well, we can do this, of course, uh, many times, and we get uh, lots of cell trajectories, and we can measure then the cell speed. And it turns out that uh, for uh, 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 shallow uh, gradients, the speed is proportional to the, uh, to the um, uh, so that actually the speed is proportional to the slope. And this is also a thing that is known from the experimental literature. So before, before going back now to uh, the question that I started with, how can uh, the ability of cells to form networks to, uh, change depending on the stiffness? I want to make a little detour to some other cell behaviors that we've been looking at. So this is durotaxis, so movement towards stiffer parts of the substrate. Uh, another uh, taxis that is called topotaxis. And, and this is relevant, for example, of uh, cells migrating into crowded environments like immune cells that uh, often uh, have a very persistent motility, uh, persistent random motility. And what has been observed by uh, physicists is that uh, these cells tend to move uh, down density gradients of topographic cues. So they, uh, th this is uh, uh, an experiment by uh, my colleagues at the physics uh, department. And uh, what they did is to, they uh, microprinted a, um, a gradient of pillars. So all each of these, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at my screen. But each of these little dots is a pillar and the cells cannot move on, on, onto it. And there's a gradient of a density gradient. Well, these are uh, dictocelium cells. So these are not um, mammalian cells, but uh, physicists like them a lot because they move very much like immune cells uh, and they're really easy to keep. Uh, so these are slime mold cells. Um, and uh, what they observed is that if you uh, track many of these cells, that uh, there is a slight drift towards the more open space, as you can see over here. And, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, speed also depends on the spacing, as you can see here. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> one second, I'm trying to shift the, the video to, slightly more convenient place but also not so convenient um, so, um, yeah Roland, you could actually minimize it if you'd like yeah that the, uh, the, like this it's uh, it's good because i'm sometimes trying to adjust her and then it's good to see if i can if you can see my gestures <laughs> but now now it's uh, now it's okay so uh, um so um So my PhD student uh, Koen Schakeraat, uh, together with uh, Luca Jomi from the physics department, they, they tried to understand this using a, uh, a model. And uh, in the beginning, they were just interested in simple Brownian particle, uh, active Brownian particles, not necessarily uh, uh, re representative of cells. And they had the following idea. So uh, they, they say, well, we have a position of a cell and uh, a direction an orientation, uh, tau, uh, the cells are uh, moving uh, according to this direction and um, uh, they, yeah, they have an, uh, with, a, with a fixed velocity and uh, maybe they have some uh, uh, extra, and they have some extra forces. And this force is coming from the interaction with the particles. So the idea is that if a, if a, a, a random, um, uh, active Brownian particles moving in the direction of a pillar, it will slide off like this. So they did this by saying, well, we have the 
uh, old velocity over here. So the component of the velocity pointing towards the center of the pillar is going to be canceled. And the resultant is that we have a new velocity uh, like this. So in this way, uh, if a particle bumps into, uh, into a uh, uh, pillar, it will kind of slide off. And so, uh, and also they assumed that uh, the particle will move forward for a little while and then take a sharp bend and move somewhere else. So that's the uh, rotational diffusion that we have over here. So now what they find is that if you do this in a gradient, if you uh, apply this model in a gradient of these pillars, that uh, over, overall, they, and you track their, um, uh, their uh, motion, of course, if we don't have a gradient, they will, uh, they will move everywhere. But the average of the, the average movement is zero, right? Because it's a diffusion process. But now if we have a slight gradient, then there is also a slight drift in the uh, mean of all the particle positions. So there's a slight turbotactic velocity. And that's what they're uh, showing over here. But it's important to note that even if we have really sharp gradients, that this drift is very slight. So, uh, so we have a very long time span. So this is a uh, normalized time. The time, assimilation time normalized over the typical time for a turn. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see that it, uh, it, this is the radius of the particles so that there is a short drift that is not much more than a couple of uh, radii for all these particles together. So it's not something you would normally see. Uh, so, uh, so what we're now doing, and this is uh, really ongoing work, is to see whether um, uh, we can uh, do a little bit better with the cellular POTS model. Uh, because the cellular POTS model allows us to, to get just a little bit more biological detail into the behavior of these cells. So, um, so what we now do is uh, we used uh, an extended cellular POTS model that is, pro uh, uh, that is proposed in Utrecht by Iona Niculescu together with, with Johannes Textor and uh, uh, Rob de Boer. And uh, they uh, have a regular cellular POTS model, but they add on top of that a field that will say, um, that will kind of keep track of the uh, direction of, of movement. And so, so uh, that's this activity level. And so if a cell by chance starts moving in a particular direction, it will continue moving more likely in that direction. And you get almost like something like a mu boy's motility. And just to give you a little bit of detail, uh, it, uh, th that's over here. So uh, we have our uh, uh, extending and retracting particles. These are the activity levels. And now they say that uh, if the activity levels are high, then um, the, there is an extra pool that will pull this activity level from a higher to a lower activity level. And uh, then they also take into account the adjacent parts and just by some experimentation they came up that it works best with the geometric mean. Uh, so the geometric mean, instead of adding up the, adding up the values, you multiply them and take this, uh, the uh, nth uh, root. Um, and um, uh, this will uh, uh, make sure that if one of these particles uh, has zero activity level, for example, because it bumps into something, uh, all the uh, activity in the, in the, in the uh, nearby will, be, will drop. And, uh, and this gives really nice immuboid motility. There are two parameters that you can tune. And what basically what Leonie van Stein, the, the PZ student who did this project uh, did, is uh, that you tuned these parameters such that the cells move quantitatively like they could observe in the experiment. And it looks about like this. So we have a, a pillar here, a pillared substrate with a gradient, and we have one of these uh, immovable moving cells. Uh, I'm, I'm speeding it up a little bit. And uh, you can see that it uh, undergoes a random walk, pretty much like what you see in the experiment. So we can, uh, I can show the, uh, the experimental movie for comparison. 
again. Oh. Huh, go on. So you can see that if you compare these two two movies, uh, at least the visual agreement is 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 quite uh, is nice. So, so of course you could now run a lot of these uh, simulations, and this is really prelim preliminary. But the first uh, first uh, results seem to indicate that we can get faster topotaxis, and that's really because the interaction with the pillars is going to be different. So, whereas in the first um, in the in the uh, more simple model, we are only cancelling the velocity. Uh, in the direction of the of the pillar, in this case, you really uh, yeah are eliminating all the velocity that is trying to move into the pillar, and it has to kind of turn around it. We're still trying to figure out what is really the difference between these two. How much time do I still have? Because I I I, I don't. I can't remember how much time we have for the for the whole seminar. We we still have time. Uh, we still have another uh, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay, all right. So because then I can, uh, I promise you to to kind of scale up again towards uh, the the angiogenesis uh, network. And uh, so f to do that, first we have to understand cellular interactions. And for that, we looked at the experiments again by the Cynthia Ryan and King group where she took these endothelial cells and played them out onto matrices of different stiffness. And now it turns out that if you take a look for pairs of cells on soft matrices, then they touch and remain in contact. If you do that on stiff matrices, they kind of touch and walk away. And on intermediate matrices, they touch, retract, touch, retract. So now what we do is we have a simplified model that has more or less the same uh, focal cohesion dynamics, but it's just a little bit more simplified. And uh, now we look at what happens if we put two cells together. So if I uh, do that on a soft matrix, the cells kind of yeah, wiggle around, they don't see each other very much. But on uh, stiff matrices, we have the same thing. They don't really care about one another. But on intermediate matrices, they generate, um, oh, they generate um, um, elong elongated cells, and they generate a field around them, which will also affect adjacent cells. So what we get by that is, first of all, this touching and retracting behavior. I, I didn't put it on this slide, but it's in the paper. And we also get elongation, uh, sorry, alignment of adjacent cells. And you can see here, we measure the, the fraction of obtuse triangles that cell pairs form. And uh, we find that uh, there are more of these obtuse triangles at these intermediate stiffnesses. Uh, well, we can, of course, also look for cell interactions on fibrous ECMs. Uh, and this is just a little bit, uh, this is also, again, a preliminary work. Um, in the beginning, uh, I showed only um, uh, um, continuous uh, matrices, but of course we know that matrices are stiff, uh, sorry, are uh, fibrous. So what we're now trying to do by a combination of the cellular POTS model and a finite element, uh, sorry, and a molecular dynamics model is to uh, also model fibrous matrices. And this of course allows us to get much more, uh, a much more detailed uh, description of the matrix. We can also consider mixtures of different uh, lengths of fibers and so forth, uh, different concentrations of cross-linkers and so forth. But this is really work in progress, but I thought it would be fun to, to just show it to you. And you can see how uh, the cells are trying to contract and kind of uh, straightening the connections between them. All right, so now we are ready to, um, to scale up to uh, collective cell behavior. So I'm initializing the simulation with lots of little cells. And of course, you can imagine that locally they're trying to align with one another. 
according to this magnet, so they, they elongate and generate, make a dipole and adjacent cells will yeah, kind of respond to the fields of one another and align. And they form a network. Uh, what is nice is that the network on the one hand has some kind of portioning behavior, uh, but on the other hand, really big um, uh, um, gaps will split up. And this is uh, a thing that's also seen in cell cultures. This is called bridging behavior. You can see it right over here. So also here, you can see the bridging behavior. So, uh, so we can start with a different initial configuration, like here. And uh, this model also turns out to be uh, sufficient to explain uh, sprouting behavior. And what happens here is that uh, the cell is, is uh, kind of peeking out this, this, um, uh, this, this blob, it's generating a strain and it pulls itself, it kind of becomes more stable on that part of the on that, on that part right over here. And it's, uh, uh, so that gives a force on one end of the cell, not on the other end. And in this way, it will move out. And, and you can see that uh, there are nice paths of cells that are following one another, and touching and retracting one another. So of course now we have, uh, so, so first of all, what is nice, I think, is that we can now predict or have an explanation for how cells can, uh, the ability of these cells uh, to form networks depends on uh, the stiffness of the matrix. Uh, but a we also have a problem because we have yet another model to form networks. So uh, in order to kind of start, um, yeah, making more detailed models to reject some hypotheses, uh, generate new hypotheses. We are now uh, really working on using these models to start reverse engineering angiogenesis. So to do that, what we're now doing is to uh, uh, do uh, parameter studies of these models. Uh, even if we don't know always the exact parameters, it's still very useful to see whether our model, for example, predicts a uh, dependence particular dependence on uh, stiffness or particular dependence on adhesion, uh, cohesion between cells and so forth. So this then leads to prediction, a qualitative prediction uh, uh, based on gradients in the parameter space. So it's kind of, uh, so we, uh, based on the sensitivity analysis basically. We can use that prediction uh, and test it in the lab and, and basically do again uh, a similar parameter uh, sweep, uh, parameter sensitivity analysis, and then uh, see whether it works in the lab. And so now I recently hired a, a technician. Uh, I also hired one of the PhD students, and I still have two vacancies on this project. So if you have any good candidates, please ask them to contact me soon. And this is one of the first examples of work coming from our, uh, our own lab. Uh, so what we're now trying to do is to give each of these cells a uh, different color based on protocol proposed sometimes, some time ago in uh, work by Parsa et al in uh, PNES. And uh, so this, uh, we almost have this working in our lab now. Uh, so I'm skipping these slides. I mean, we can also look for other things. We can look for alignment of cells. Uh, so uh, for example, in tendons, if you apply a static strain, cells tend to align with this static strain and we can uh, use exactly the same model to predict that. If you want to know more, look at this paper. Uh, because if I still have a little bit of time, how much time do I still have? Um, uh, you have another maybe two to three minutes. Okay, I'll let, let me just walk you over if you want to know the details. Uh, just look for this, uh, this DOI over here. This is some bioarchive. And uh, this is work of a postdoc of mine. Uh, Enrico uh, Sandro Colizzi, and he's interested in collective cell behavior and the evolution of multicellular uh, cooperation. And his hypothesis is that uh, cells facilitate, uh, that uh, uh, moving collectively facilitates the navigation of environmental 
cues. So he has this really simple model where he has a really noisy gradient and uh, the gradient leads the cells to a hotspot where they can reproduce most effectively. And you can imagine, for example, if you have an analogy with addictive stelium, uh, cellular slime mold, it has a single cell phase and a multicellular phase and it has to move to a nice and warm and light, nice warm light and dry spot in order to reproduce. And it can only do so, it does so collectively, not individually. So you can really see this as a, as a, uh, as a model for, very simple model for, chemo, uh, for uh, collective behavior in dictus stelium. So what he does, he has, um, uh, he assumes that these cells can adhere to one another and they have, um, uh, receptor ligand pairs that need to match in order for them to adhere and they can evolve. And individually, chemotaxis is very inefficient in this model. So we have our persistently moving cells. Um, they, um, uh, they have a mechanism individually to uh, find uh, higher concentrations. But uh, the, the, they respond, respond to that so badly that they really cannot move up this gradient quite efficiently. But now if we uh, have exactly the same parameters, but now we say that the cells adhere to one another, then we get this. So now the cells are uh, moving as a cluster and just by kind of eliminating all, all this noisy noisiness of the movement, it moves quite efficiently towards the, uh, towards the, the hotspot. And you can see this, he analyzed this in, in lots of detail. Um, so now his question is, can this also evolve? So he has uh, the following setup. He says that there is, is a seasonal uh, setup. So uh, every 10,000 time steps, MCS is an abbreviation for Monte Carlo step, a time step in the cell pulse model. And uh, every time the gradient, uh, every season the gradient changes orientation. And then at the end there is a reproduction phase and uh, the effect effectivity, it's really reproduction of individual cells. And so what they inherit is the, uh, the key and locks that they have. Um, and the, the further, the, the closer they are to this hotspot, the more efficient their reproduction is going to be. And during this reproduction, we're introducing some mutations of these ligands and receptors. And so let's see what happens. So here's our hotspot. So, uh, so the arena has a half circle and initially cells are moving uh, on their own. And there are some lucky ones that, uh, that can make it to the hotspot, but overall uh, they're not really efficient. But then a couple of cells manage to mutate their ligands and receptors such that they uh, adhere. Uh, so they can cooperate with the others to find the gradient quite efficiently. And, and of course the system will pick up this quite quickly and efficiently and over time we get an evolution of multicellularity. And you can see indeed how the movement is now speeding up. Well, so he analyzed this in detail and, and he found a couple of interesting things. So first of all, that uh, the ability of these cells to evolve um, uh, multicellularity depends on the season length. So here we have the eventual adhesion so this means, uh, uh, this means individual cells, uh, sorry. Um, oh yeah, so we look for the cell uh, surface tension. So a low surface tension means uh, unicellular, a high surface tension means multicellular. And you can see that for short seasons, they, they, it's more efficient to be on your own because then you just move around randomly and if you're lucky, you're there to reproduce. But if the season, cell, season is longer, there is sufficient time to uh, cluster and to move collectively. So, um, uh, and you get a multicellular phase. 
But interestingly, there is a, a bi-stable uh, phase in between. So these are other parameters to measure that. Please focus on the green, on the green curve. And, uh, and indeed, uh, there is a uh, separatrix between them that will lead you either to the unicellular phase or to the multicellular phase. Now, what's going on here? There's actually some really interesting stuff that is interference competition. So uh, it means that the, uh, one, uh, the two phenotypes are there together, but whether uh, the multicellular phenotype is going to uh, be able to find the cues depends on where the single cells are. And in this case, the single cells are in the way of the multicellular phase. And, uh, but if they are the other way around, then the, the multicellular phase will just move efficiently to the, uh, to the uh, target. So, so uh, this is a full analysis of that. So uh, uh, you see uh, two cases where he set up the system with a particular, uh, I'd say, configurations of single cells and multi multiple cells, uh, cluster, cell clusters. And if the cell cluster is in front, then it moves efficiently, like this. And uh, you can see that the multicellular, so this is the distance from the gradient peak after uh, a, a set uh, a preset time. And so you can see that the single cells are really effective, but now if the single cells, uh, sorry, the multiple, sorry, the cell clusters are really effective. So now if the single cells are in front of the clusters, then they're just, have the same efficiency. And this is also true for uh, a smaller cluster. So if uh, the, um, uh, uh, the big clusters are in front, then uh, yeah, they, so it really is independent of the uh, numbers of single cells and, and uh, uh, of sing, uh, cells, single cells and cells in the cluster. So sorry, I, I rushed a little bit over the last uh, story, but please uh, have a look at this uh, at this preprint. Um, so um, uh, some acknowledgements. So um, a lot of the work was done by Lisanne Rent, that's the work on cell extracellular matrix interactions. The Tober Texas work was done by Leonie van Stijn. I showed some work on cell elongation done by uh, Margriet Palm. René van Oers was a postdoc who worked also with Lisanne to uh, do, uh, to develop these uh, cell extracellular matrix interaction models. I didn't show the work, oh yeah, I did show the work by Kuhn on Topo Texas on the active Brownian particle motion. Kuhn also did some recent work on um, um, uh, using the cellular POTS model. He's actually going to get his PhD on Wednesday, unfortunately in the same kind of setting. But, uh, uh, and uh, my collaborators and funding. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ronald, for the for a great talk. Um, uh, we'll uh, open the, uh, the the forum for discussion and questions. I just want to say that there's one uh, my collaborator actually wrote a long comment. Um, I'll, I'm going to read it for you because she had to leave the next meeting. Uh, she said, "The wonderful seminar, great work. Just a couple of comments. I have uh, I have to get to my next meeting. Experimentally, we often see cell elongation even on glass when ECM proteins are at a very low density." I uh -huh. have always assumed this is because the cells only find a few traction points. I guess forcing the polarity uh, with limited ACM binding sites. We also see a lot of cell network formation in breast epithelial cells grown on top of uh, gel tricks, but not on 3D collagen ACM. Uh -huh. Based on your work, I'm wondering if it might be due to the stiffness. We have to look at this. That's what you that's, said. But you have to go. That's a good question. I'd I'd, I'd love to discuss this in more detail um, because um, so so I didn't completely catch the question. So so the, the so she says that on uh, low low density ECMs the cells also tend to elongate, but is that on a, uh, is that done on a very stiff substrate or is it also uh, is this also on a flexible substrate? Um, so she's saying that elongation, even in the gla uh, on glass, when ACM proteins are at very low density. Right. So that's that's interesting. And so one of the explanations could be uh, that they have 
very few uh, places to hold on to. And that then basically they, uh, how, how should you say, they, they uh, reach out to these points and they... Uh, Wouldn't that cause maybe uh, more of a cell spreading rather than... Yeah, maybe it's more cell spreading, but uh, I, I'd love to discuss with this with her further. Maybe, mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. maybe I can talk with her at uh, at, at uh, yeah yeah absolutely. I mean the um, yeah. Also regarding uh, breast uh, breast epithelial cells, um, I we we are actually I'm, uh, we just sub resubmitted the paper on on uh, branching morphogenesis. Uh, that is um, uh, that is based on the on 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 the work by uh, Celeste Nelson, where she puts. Um, uh, memory gland uh, epithelial cells in uh, um, in in um, uh, uh, shapes of uh, on, in specific shapes, and she finds curvature dependent sprouting. And maybe maybe I I, I hope to put it on bioarchive uh, maybe today or later this weekend. And uh, so this could be quite interesting for her. Okay. I mean, we could uh, we could discuss it further with uh, with her and uh, yourself. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, any other question? Of course, uh, please you could uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a question, Stephen Watson, uh, calling in from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, Hello. Simulations at the beginning, where you were showing the formation of the networks, the networks were emerging from your POTS model. Uh huh. My question is. Do you have a continuum theory, an effective theory for that network dynamics? Um, unfortunately not, not of the, uh, and I would love to, to have this, and I've been nagging some collaborators and students for years to, uh, to help me get this done. Um, yeah, so, one, one, uh, yeah, one thing I noted, just a comment, you, you later showed some angiogenesis simulations, again, similarly showing these emerging networks. And I think one thing that I was struck by is that the junction structure was principally order four, not order three. So I was sort of expecting order three junctions. And I was also expecting certain specific angles to come up, but I didn't see either of those things. Does it, and are you referring to the elongated ones or to the... Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that was, that, was, that was a much later simulation. There was a simulation early on, which didn't have anisotropy, or perhaps it did at the elliptical. Yeah. It sells. That's and that's later you an angiogenesis. I mean, either, either are interesting. Maybe the one at the beginning was the one which. That's a good point. I've never looked at the um, at the junction values, uh, junction orders, or never looked at the angles. And that's yeah, because, yeah. if you upscale and you think about it as some sort of force network, an effective force network then you would expect that there'd be some equilibrium conditions uh, right. present in the junctions or potentially some perturbations of equilibrium if it's active. Right. Yes. Um, that is a good point. But uh, um, so, so let, let me, yeah, we should actually, we should really try this out to uh, uh, and you and you mean you mean of course to compare with um, uh, with other types of network formation yeah, uh, for yeah I, mean, uh, I mean there's there's but because you have this coarsening that you mentioned as well there's interesting yeah. sort of logical parameters you could look at the power laws perhaps associated with the right. process are there yeah. that's a good point thanks about I yeah, will look yeah. into it actually. You will. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write to you. I've got a few network problems of my own. Uh, right. From nanoscience, they're not they're not bio. Uh -huh. but in the world of universality, uh, yeah, maybe some interesting intersections. Right. What is your name again? Stephen Watson. Oh, hi. Hello. Okay. Yeah. You think of uh, Sherlock Holmes' sidekick in Scotland Yard? That'll help you remember the Watson part. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll write to you, Roland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other question?
Okay, well, uh, while we're waiting for other people to ask questions, then maybe I'll ask mine. Um, um, so one thing that uh, you mentioned, uh, this, uh, this bi-stability that uh, uh, you observed in the last uh, figure when look at, looking at the aggregation versus single cell migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the slam uh, uh, mode. This idea actually crossed my mind uh, right from the start of your talk when you looked at, uh, for example, uh, velocity versus, versus slope, etc. Uh, did, did you observe this sort of uh, bi-stability as well in other features, not just in this, this, uh, these simulations as well? No, no, we never, uh, we never observed, uh, observed it. it. Depends, of course, what you call bi-stability. Uh, um, but we never thought of characterizing it in this particular way. I mean, of course, there is some dependence on the initial conditions in, in this. So, for example, when you looked at the stiffness, the stiffness, uh, and yeah. you change the slope of the stiffness, and you looked at the velocity of uh, of uh, the, the these virtual cells. So you didn't see any. Uh, oh, oh, you mean this one, the Duratexis? Yeah, exactly. So before, yeah. Uh, so your questions: Do we see biasability over here? Um, I, I. I wouldn't. So, why would you expect it in the in the Dura Texas uh, model? Um, I, I mean, you know, um, I would say it's mainly because uh, it's typically observed in in such uh, such systems. I mean, honestly, I don't have a, an explanation uh, aside from this that you could actually observe two features in an intermediate range of the uh, uh, stiffness slope that you. Mm -hmm. could perhaps uh, both features. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so it's really... So, go ahead, sorry. No, it's a, it's a really good question because we never, we never looked, looked at biostability in, in, in this type of systems, but uh, we do observe that, uh, and, and that's why I was moving to this other slide for the um, uh, network formation. We do uh -huh. observe, of course, that um, Sometimes different initial conditions give really different patterns. And sometimes, uh, so I think this is a good example where uh, we go from network patterns to more kind of stel stellate patterns. Mm -hmm. And if we, uh, if we do this in some, some of our other models, then um, the, um, uh, for example, the cell elongation model, we start with a blob, we also get a nice network. Right, so the, the final pattern is very similar uh, depending on, uh, irrespective of whether you start with a blob of cells or whether you start with a, a distribution of cells. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, at least on first sight, it seems to be, seems to be different. So this would be really nice to, to look into in a bit more detail to see whether, um, whether also here we could find some biasability. I think, I think that's a great question actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've no idea. Yeah, I've really no idea. Yeah. Um, so so the other thing is, um, uh, it's two two more questions, and I'll, I promise to, to stop. So uh, you talked about uh, the field. What do you mean by the field when you look at the elongation? Like you know when they the ah, okay. align next to each other. I didn't understand exactly what you meant by that. Uh, so do you mean that in this model, or do you? Yeah, mean this model, it? for example, exactly. So, so, so basically what we do is we have a, um, we have a cellular pods model and we have on top of that, we have some additional fields. So for example, in the cell elongation model, in the first one, we have um, our cellular pods model, then we couple that to a partial differential equation model, mm -hmm. where, uh, uh, which is, uh, let me see if I have some, something to, yeah, which is basically uh, this. So it's, uh, right, it's the most simple differential equation we could get. We solve it numerically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We, say, we say we have some, some concentration of a, of a signal, uh -huh. C, uh, over time. Uh -huh. It diffuses and it's degrading. And we have a source term. And now we say the source term is only active at the places where we have cells. So now what we do, we solve the, the cellular pods model for a little while. Mm 
then uh, we go back to the uh, we go to the, we solve the differential equation model uh, for a little while, and we go back to the Stellar Plots model. So we couple the two models together, mm -hmm. and using a kind of operating sp operator splitting approach. And what I mean by field is is this field C, and in this case, in the case of this this particular model, uh, the field is a is a um, um, is a uh, finite element model. And so, uh, so the, the cellular pots model then affects the strains in the finite element model, and the strains then affect uh, the dynamics of the cellular pots model. Yes, I see. Okay, okay, I got it. So could I uh, add something? Uh, in fact, when you add a Brownian motion to an ODE that gives a stochastic ODE, and right. An approximation, a classical approximation, is a black and Shaw's equation in finance, and that's exactly a heat equation. So right. Could that yes. be related to that uh, in uh, in your model? Um. Uh. Well, how do you, how do you mean exactly be, uh, uh, how it could be related? Um, in fact, when it, you when you have a Brownian motion, when you add a Brownian motion to an ordinary differential equation, right. yes, you get a SDE. And this SD yeah. as a classical approximation of transformation for right. the density of probability, which is uh, uh, what is called the Black and Scholes equation in finance, uh -huh. but yes. which is in fact a reaction diffusion equation. Could that right. be a way to obtain uh, your models that you described on the paper you right. just wrote on? So can I rephrase your question as by saying that uh, could we have a particle-based distribution, a particle-based description of our um, diffusive, of our signal molecules? And I, I think we could do that. Uh, uh, or would you say, is your question, could, you, could we have an, uh, make use of this theory to get an analytical solution for the field? No, not for obtaining, but to obtain the reaction diffusion equation that you just saw us. Ah, okay. Yes, that is that is uh, that is true. Um, uh, related to that, uh, so what we what we also do now is look at uh, the um, uh, uh, how do you say it, the stochastic material of, of the, uh, for example, in this um, uh, topotactic model that I showed. Uh, this cells is undergoing is 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 um, the micro microscopic dynamics of this single cell. Is generating a uh, persistent random walk, and indeed, okay. of course, if we measure then the long-term behavior, it's giving again a diffusion equation. Okay. Now, so, what is interesting, and this is really ongoing work, is that we can modify also the dynamics of the uh, of the single cell, and for example, the adhesion to the matrix, and then get get uh, subdiffusive behavior. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and so this is now, uh, we are now writing this up and I hope it should be up on, on archive or by archive uh, anytime soon-ish. <laughs> so the PC student is uh, now working on some uh, revisions. I'd be happy to share this with you. Who, who, who is this, by the way? I'm uh, Olivier Lafitte. I'm uh, from uh, Paris 13 University and I'm presently the head of the uh, French lab in CRM. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you so much. So yes. I, would, uh, I would like to have these notes on archives that you are about to, to publish. Yeah. So please, yeah, so please uh, 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 if you could drop me an email, then, then I, 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 I have your email address. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are people writing questions. Uh, um, I, I prefer not reading them. If you can actually uh, unmute yourself and ask them. Uh, hey, hi, Professor. Uh, can I go ahead for a question? Hello. So I wanted to thank you. I want to thank you for the very nice presentation. I just Thanks. a question uh, regarding the model for angiogenesis. I was wondering if you have considered including the concept of tip and stock cells to, to the ah, model. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, great question. Thanks. Uh, so yes, um, in different ways. 
Um, so we have one paper where we um, consider a hypothesis by a colleague of mine, experimental colleague who, who uh, was able to separate tip and stalk cells based on uh, the expression of uh, CD34 uh, cyalomucin. Uh, and uh, so they found if they sorted out these cells using, uh, uh, using uh, facts, I believe, they could um, get different kind of behavior for in vitro for these different cells. And so we try to get an explanation for why this is. And then we have a sec second paper where uh, we look at a particular kind of, uh, so uh, a kind of different hypothesis of tips and stalk cell behavior. And that is that uh, uh, tip cells, of course, traditionally are thought to move in front of the, of the sprout and the stalk cells kind of follow them. But uh, more recent insights show that cells, tip cells can actually, stalk cells can overtake the tip cells. And um, well, there are some hypotheses in the literature for why this is, but we actually also observe it in our very simple uh, angiogenesis models. Yes. So then uh, this made me think that maybe uh, what is happening there is that uh, uh, the, um, there's no real regulation of tip and stalk cell behavior, but uh, gene expression is more enslaved by uh, the mixing behavior, right? So, so what we did is to build in every cell uh, delta notch network uh, and uh, ran our model, then let the gene expression be dictated by the uh, position yes, uh, yes. relative to the other cells. And again, the gene network changed some uh, physical properties of the cells. And in this way, we could actually fairly nicely reproduce some data pr uh, published uh, by the uh, horror Garrett group that uh, they had uh, a kind of more genetic, uh, uh, genetically determined hypothesis for. Yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, so I'd be happy to share these papers. Uh, one of them is, is uh, Boas, Boas and Merix, and the other one is Palm et al. Uh, if you send me a line, I can give you the reference. Yeah, yeah, I would appreciate that. Thank you very much for the answer. Yeah. Oh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for this uh, very knowledgeable talk. Uh, I'm actually new to this uh, field of mathematical biology. So uh, I, I had a question that how do the uh, cells grow with time? Like how do they, uh, in, in your model, how do they uh, procure a nutrient or uh, the source of their uh, growth? And how do, like, do you, have you inculcated growth and the death of cells uh, with the time? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. That's a great question. And, and it depends a little bit on what's, what we assume. Um, and uh, um, so let me first go to your, your last, uh, the last part of your question is, um, I, I can show you uh, uh, this particular simulation. Uh, how does it work? Um, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to sh show it without. Um, anyway, I usually use keynotes and I recently started doing this and uh, so I'm now confused trying to un unhide the slide, but uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. I can show it like this. So uh, so what you see here is a, is a simulation of angiogenesis where we have growth and division. And in this case, we uh, said that every cell grows at a particular rate. And we do that by, uh, in the Hamiltonian, we have uh, a cell adhesion component and we have an uh, area constraint. And what we can now do is, so what the cell tries to do is to stay close to this area constraint, to this target area. Uh, and that's because every copy that will bring it closer to the target area will uh, be energetically beneficial. So it's almost like, an, it behaves like an elastic solid. So now what we can do is just change, increase the target area by, uh, um, uh, um, yeah, we can slowly increase the target area so the cell will then have to follow. And then if we, uh, if the cell reaches a maximum area, we simply divide it by two by assigning half of the area to a new, giving it a new number. So in this way, assigning 
into a new cell. And so that is, in this, uh, this is an example where we have growth and division. And then of course, how, you know, your other questions uh, were, um, so yeah, what, what determines then growth? That entirely depends on our assumptions. So in this case, we uh, simply, we assume that uh, cells uh, start growing if there is some tension on them. But in other simulations, we have assumed they need some food. And in other simulations, we have assumed they uh, just grow like that. So it de really depends on the biological question you want to ask. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your answer. So uh, my, uh, the question uh, was also this, that how is a nutrient depletes with time? Like have you considered nutrient depletion with time and uh, the change in or diffusion uh, of the nutrient itself? Right. Yeah. So, so in the model I showed you today, it's it's uh, we have um, we have the the most we take the most minimal assumption, and that is indeed that uh, the cells produce uh, a growth factor, that it diffuses, and that uh, there's a first order de de degradation, uh, and this is because we don't really know how it works. Uh, for example. What we do know is that uh, these kind of growth factors can bind to the extracellular matrix and can unbind, this can change their activity. And what we're currently doing in some, some more recent work is that we, we have a bit more detail on that. And so for example, these kind of growth factors could also change the mechanics of the extracellular matrix. It's now also known that tension can release uh, some of these growth factors. So there's all kinds of interesting dynamics that we can study by making these rules a bit more complicated. So, so again, it depends very much on the biology and, and what we tend to do is to start as simple as possible. And then once we know, okay, now this is really incorrect because we now have this more data or we see now that the model gives the wrong predictions, then we have a good reason to try and make these things a bit more complicated and see whether with a more complicated model we can understand things better. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Any other question? So, okay. So, thank you very much, Roland, for a uh, really great, uh, great talk. Uh, was very, uh, very informative. Uh, thank two you questions much. I would like to ask you, uh, which are more on the administrative side. Uh, we recorded your talk. Is it okay if we post it online? Sure. Um, uh, you mean the whole talk? Uh, no. uh, let me see. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, uh, there, I was thinking there is, yeah, there is this Topo Texas, which is still unpublished, but this will be fine. Uh, we, we will publish it really soon. Okay. Uh, and it's really pre preliminary. Okay. All right. Uh, ah, there's only this, this part on the, on the fibrous ECMs. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's, it's been online as well. So that's, uh, that's okay. okay. Okay, great. The other uh, question I have is, um, uh, maybe we should schedule a meeting between uh, yourself, myself, and uh, Claire, my collaborator, yeah, just to get some feedback about some of the things that we're doing. Hopefully, at yeah. that point, is that yeah. okay? Okay, yeah. Ali, we will we'll discuss these details because we're doing something. We're doing using also the cellular pot model, but uh, instead, of instead of looking at the mechanics of this, looking at the uh, chemical network that happens within the cell and see ah. how that actually has utility. We, yeah. I mean, love to hear your feedback on this and see whether if we're heading in the right direction or not. All right, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that would be great. I'd, I'd look forward to that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thank you again for everything and uh, hope well, to see you soon. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was uh, really uh, my pleasure. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Take care, bye. Bye-bye, have a good weekend. You too.